Hi, everyone. Is this too loud? It's okay? Okay. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Luka Milkovic. I come from Infigo IS Croatia. And my today's talk will be about defeating Windows memory forensics. Actually, about uh, reusing some uh, well known techniques, uh, f some well known anti forensic techniques, and applying them to memory forensics. So here's the agenda for today, for tonight. Uh, first, we, I'll give some uh, general overview of uh, memory forensics. Why do we do it and how do we do it? Uh, I'll mention two uh, processes re uh, related to memory forensics, namely uh, memory acquisition and memory analysis. I'm sure that all of you are at least a bit aware of uh, those terms and uh, terms of uh, computer forensics and anti-forensics techniques as well. So this part could be a bit boring to you. Uh, we'll then uh, familiarize ourselves with the current state of the memory anti-forensic techniques. Uh, and then we'll take a deeper look into the memory acquisition process and uh, we, we want to see whether there are any uh, issues, any weak links in this process. Uh, I will then present uh, my own proof of concept tool that exploits these issues and uh, which tries, tries to hide uh, arbitrary artifacts from the memory dump. Uh, and at the end of the presentation, we will try to come to some conclusions and uh, uh, try to uh, find possible uh, b uh, some additional uh, methods, some, uh, some ways to handle these problems. A quick slide about me. Uh, as Carlos Garcia Prado in the next room would say, I'm nobody, but I'm currently working on a privilege escalation. Uh, by the way, I'm kind of sad that uh, we are giving our talks at the same time because I think he has a very nice talk and uh, I would definitely go listen to his talk, but unfortunately it's at the same time as mine. Uh, I'm also Info Security Consultant. I'm the short one on the left. Uh, the, this huge guy on the right is uh, Branko Spasojevic. Uh, maybe some of you know, know him. Uh, he was here two years ago. He gave a talk on code, uh, the obfuscation by optimization. So cheers, Branko, if you're watching this. Uh, I'm also avid cyclist. I like to ride my bike, uh, especially over high mountain passes. But since it's hard to do so in this time of year, I rather hack or code. And uh, this presentation is a direct result of this last bullet. OK, so back to the topic. Uh, why do we do memory forensics? Why, why anyone does it? Well, uh, for more than a decade, a uh, prevalent method of uh, performing forensics was doing disk forensics. But uh, in the last couple of years, uh, memory forensics is becoming increasingly popular. So why is that so? Because uh, incident handlers uh, figured out that there are uh, lots of uh, interesting information in volatile data. For example, uh, some data can uh, help incident handlers during malware analysis. Uh, some malware can be obfuscated or encrypted while on disk and uh, can be uh, uh, almost completely or uh, partially uh, in clean uh, state in memory. Uh, using uh, memory forensics, uh, incident handlers can, uh, can um, analyze malware, which is memory resident. Some malware is sophisticated and does not touch the disk, stays in memory. So it's not possible to detect them using disk forensics, but only uh, via uh, memory dumps. Um, I mean, memory forensics is also interesting because it gives a snapshot of the current state of the machine that is being examined. You can uh, look at the list of current processes, list of current threads, connections, and all sorts of things, but also the connections and processes that have been recently terminated. It's very interesting to uh, incident handlers, but it's also interesting to the bad guys because, uh, as we know, uh, memory dump can contain uh, some sensitive information such as passwords, for example, BIOS. You can even retrieve uh, BitLocker passwords, TrueCrypt passwords, and passwords for all sorts of services and websites. Uh, how do we do memory forensics? Well, uh, it has two consecutive processes. First process is the process of uh, collecting the memory image or memory acquisition, while the second process is memory analysis or analyzing this image and uh, trying to find some uh, OS artifacts. Uh, regarding the memory acquisition, uh, from a software perspective, uh, it can be done in two ways. Uh, first way is uh, to use some third-party tool, and the second way is to use uh, Windows integrated methods. When I uh, say Windows integrated, uh, one of the methods is to read the hibernation file. This file contains some data, uh, interesting, for forensically interesting data, that will be used for booting the machine up from the hibernate state, and it can be forensically valuable. Uh, the other mechanism, 
which is integrated into the Windows operating system is uh, the crash dump mechanism, uh, which if configured correctly produces a memory dump, uh, we'll see which memory dump, uh, uh, when the intentional blue screen of that is incurred. That uh, definitely means that the machine will be rebooted, but uh, the memory dump will be created. Uh, when we use external tools, uh, most external tools uh, produce so-called raw dump, which is an exact uh, picture, an exact image of physical memory, uh, while some of the tools also uh, support proprietary Microsoft format crash dumps uh, without uh, causing the system reboot. Uh, there are many tools, uh, some, of, some of them are mentioned here, uh, most notably Moonsol's Win32DD, there are many others, Memorize, FTK Imager, WinBeamM, and many, many others. So how does acquisition actually work? Uh, it has, every memory acquisition tool has two components. First component is the user mode component, second component is the kernel mode or the driver. Uh, why does the memory acquisition tool need the driver? Well, uh, after Windows 2003 Service Pack 1, it's uh, no longer possible to map view of a device physical memory from the user mode. So you need the driver to map this device, to access this device. Uh, many memory acquisition tools are just using a driver just as a proxy for device physical memory, which is not a very good thing to do. We'll see why later. Uh, some other tools are using documented kernel APIs, such as MMMAP IOSpace, while others, most notably Win32DD, are using some uh, undocumented kernel functions, such as MMMAP memory dump MDL. This is the default uh, setting of Win32DD. Uh, regarding the format differences, uh, crash dump, which is a proprietary Microsoft format, uh, contains processor registers, but does not contain first memory page or and uh, memory reserved for devices. Uh, raw dumps, on the other hand, do not contain processor registers, but they usually contain first memory page and device memory. I say usually because it's really a tool dependent setting. Some tools uh, omit the first page and device memory, so if that's important to you, if you're doing forensics, be sure to look at your tool documentation to, to see whether it omits the first page and device memory. Uh, okay, so the next process is the analysis. Uh, analysis is simply the process of reading the memory dump and trying to identify some OS artifacts from this dump. Uh, there are lots and lots of tools for memory analysis. Uh, my personal choice is volatility. You probably heard about volatility and used it. Uh, it's a very powerful tool. It has a lot of plugins. It's constantly being developed. It has a very vibrant community and it's a great tool. Uh, there are other tools, for example, uh, Memorize or Mem uh, Mandiant Redline, which is a front end to, to Memorize. Uh, there are others, uh, for example, HB Gary Responder, uh, NCase has some plugins for memory analysis and so on. Uh, regarding the formats, all tools support raw dump uh, formats, so if you want to analyze your dump using multiple memory analysis tools, then be sure to, uh, to use raw dump or to convert it from raw dump to other formats. Uh, the tools are, have currently weak support for crash dumps or other formats, so if you want portability, use raw dumps. Okay, so uh, let's look at the big picture of memory forensics. How does the memory forensic work? Incident Handler first starts the acquisition tool. This acquisition tool installs the driver inside the kernel. This driver uses uh, some of the mentioned algorithms to map uh, physical memory and uh, reads, uh, reads uh, page by page or some bigger chunks of memory and writes those chunks into the memory dump or sends this chunk over the network where the remote uh, server is doing a write to, to this dump file. This concludes the uh, acquisition phase of the memory forensics. Uh, incident handler then launches analysis tool, which reads this memory dump and tries to identify certain artifacts from the, from the memory dump. Okay, so uh, let's see something about the currently known uh, memory anti-forensic techniques. Let's start from the really simple ones and move to more advanced ones. Uh, first, really simple and stupid method uh, is oriented towards acquisition blocking. So uh, this method simply prevents uh, memory acquisition tool from loading its driver or from starting. Uh, all those tools have uh, drivers with uh, predictable or well-known names. So if you uh, disable driver loading with specific name, you uh, effectively block the acquisition. 
uh, there used to be a Metasploit script. If I remember correctly, uh, it uh, prevented Memorize from loading its driver, but uh, it's not available anymore. I haven't found it anywhere. Uh, anyway, this, this method is really, can be evaded really simple because uh, you can simply rename the tool, effectively renaming its process, or you can rename the driver. Uh, that's easy if you have the source code. If you don't have the source code, it's nevertheless possible, but much harder. Uh, but uh, using this method, blocking the complete acquisition, that rings all sorts of alarms for the incident handler, so he'll definitely, if he cannot proceed, proceed with the memory acquisition, he'll definitely know that something is not right, and he will try to, to look deeper in, in, into the situation. So this is, this is really not a, a cool um, memory, defeat, memory analysis defeating uh, uh, technique. More advanced uh, technique was proposed this year by Haruyama and Suzuki. Uh, their work was called One Byte Modification for Breaking Memory Forensic Analysis. Uh, what Haruyama and Suzuki did was uh, they conducted the research on uh, well-known memory analysis applications, and they figured out that all memory analysis applications have three key steps. Uh, they perform three key steps. First step is virtual address translation. Second step is OS and architecture detection. And third step is trying to identify some kernel objects, some uh, kernel artifacts. And um, they did a research and they uh, found out that every tool has some so-called abort factors, that every tool has uh, some issues with uh, those three key steps. And for example, uh, they, uh, they found out that the uh, HB Gary responder is traversing the process list by first finding the PS initial system process or the process with the name system. So if you rename the system process to, I don't know, not system, uh, the, the process traversing list will not, will not work and the uh, HB Gary responder will supposedly not uh, be able to traverse this list. Uh, this technique is cool. It, uh, it makes some subtle modifications. They can be really hard to detect. I mean, not this example with uh, not system renaming, with system renaming, but some other modifications can be really subtle. Uh, the disadvantage, uh, disadvantages of this technique is, uh, are that uh, this, uh, it, it's not possible to hide uh, absolutely any, any object inside the operating system, I mean arbitrary object, because uh, that could cause some instabilities of the system and could crash the system. Uh, this technique also breaks the entire analysis or big part of analysis and that can definitely raise some suspicion of, on the incident handler side. Uh, another work on uh, memory anti-forensics was proposed uh, like seven years ago by Sparks and Butler. Uh, some of you might, might recall it. It's called, uh, they created a proof of concept rootkit called Shadow Walker. Uh, what they did is they created a custom page, a page fault handler and uh, they marked uh, every memory location that they want to hide as not present, as being swapped out, as being paged out. Uh, additionally, they cleared out the complete translation leukocyte buffer and they synchronized the instruction and data translation leukocyte buffer. By doing this, they, uh, they actually made sure that every access to the memory location that's supposed to be hidden uh, will cause a page fault, and their page fault, custom page fault handler will be called. Uh, in this uh, custom page fault handler, they check whether this, the, the access to the memory location was read or write. If it was read or write, they simply disallow this access and redirect the, the caller to some arbitrary memory location. If this access was an execute access, they allow this access, so your rootkit is allowed to execute, but it's not allowed to be written to or to be read. This is a really cool technique and uh, awesome idea uh, because, uh, because it's cool and because you can almost hide, uh, you can hide almost any object. Uh, but it has, certainly has some disadvantages. Uh, I tested it and it's really unstable. It's uh, completely unusable on uh, multiprocessor systems because they didn't add uh, um, MP support. I tried to add it, but it's, um, it, it's simply not stable. Uh, and uh, another, another thing is that the page fault handler itself is visible. So the code of the page fault handler is visible and the interrupt descriptor table hook is also visible. You cannot hide it using this method. Uh, another thing with this method is that uh, it has uh, some performance impact, especially if you try to hide uh, multiple locations because every access to the location will cause a page fault. Okay, so let's get back to this uh, memory forensics workflow. Uh, can anyone tell me where, what do you think is the weakest link on the memory acquisition side of the, of the process? 
So concentrate on the memory acquisition. Installing the driver. Sorry? Installing the driver. Maybe, but you can only block the acquisition then. Sorry, exactly. Yes. That's the most critical part. Uh, the, the, the point where you are actually writing the dump or sending the dump over the network, sending the chunks of memory over the, over the network, is the weakest link in the memory acquisition process. And if an attacker has kernel access, this is really a game over for, for uh, memory forensics. I know that this sounds familiar because uh, six years ago, Darren Bilby did a similar thing with the DeFi rootkit. Uh, he, did, uh, he, he created a disk filter driver which faked disk reads and uh, he faked uh, mappings of uh, physical memory, uh, access to device physical memory. So I'm definitely not doing anything new here, but I'm just mapping, I'm just reusing old uh, and well-known uh, anti-forensic techniques and applying them to memory forensics. So you can think of this work as more as an evolution than a revolution. Okay, so it's time to introduce my tool. Uh, it's called Dementia, and apart from having a really lame name, it's a proof of concept tool for hiding uh, almost arbitrary objects from the memory dump. Uh, it has a user mode and kernel mode component, uh, and it currently supports three methods of hiding. Two are kernel mode related, and one is uh, user mode related. I'll talk about them later. Uh, it has been tested on Windows XP, on Windows Vista and Windows 7. It's uh, more or less stable on all of those uh, operating systems if there are 32 bits. On 64 bits, uh, user mode injection is working and the driver is very experimental and I don't advise you that you use it. So how does dementia work? Uh, as we saw previously, what we want to do is to intercept uh, write calls, so to, to somehow control the process of writing the dump. Uh, there are two methods, those are the two um, previously mentioned methods. The first method is, um, is to uh, hook the anti-write file by placing an inline hook. Uh, I have tested it, it's not supported by Microsoft. Uh, it has been tested both on multiprocessor systems, both for hooking and unhooking, and it's pretty stable. Uh, but I, I don't know if any one of you is into driver development, but if you are, you probably know about Don Byrne. He's a guy from OSR online forum and mailing list. And if you ask him anything, even remotely not supported by Microsoft, he'll freak out. And if you ask him anything about hooking, he'll probably kill you over the wire. So don't, don't use hooking. Uh, the, proposed, the proposed method of uh, intercepting the right calls, uh, intercepting the process of writing the dump, is to make a file system mini filter driver. So that's the second method Dementia use, uses. Uh, and um, this, is, this is a really nice and really stable method, but from a blackhead perspective it might be too noisy because it leaves a lot of artifacts inside the system and you have to make sure that you um, clear all those artifacts which can be, which can be daunting. Uh, maybe IRP hooks can be, would be a better solution, but I, I have chosen to, to write a file system mini filter. Uh, as you also know, hooking is a big no-no in 64-bit in kernels because of the patch guard, so you cannot just hook anywhere and anywhere on anything inside the 64-bit kernels, so many filters are really the way to go. Okay, so now we have the hook in place, but what's next? How do we know whether the file being written is actually forensic uh, uh, memory dump or some other regular operating system file? Well, it turns out that uh, all of the memory acquisition tools have some patterns. So when I, when I say patterns, I mean uh, specific uh, anti-write file arguments. I mean that the, this calls anti-write file is executed from a specific context, from a specific process. Uh, we can detect the pr uh, presence of a certain driver and so on. Uh, also, a uh, file object being written ha can have spe uh, specific values and flags. Uh, this table below summarizes my research on those patterns, and uh, you can read this pattern like this, uh, th this table like this. So, for example, FTK Imager uh, has anti-write file arguments such that uh, handle is always in user mode, event APC routine, APC context are always null, uh, IO, status buff, I IO status block is uh, in user mode, buffer is in user mode, length is always uh, 8,000 hexadecimal, and so on. And using this table, it's relatively easy to detect whether a, a file being written belongs to a memory dump, or rep represents a memory dump. Uh, 
what I also want to emphasize here are these two columns, handle and buffer. First column uh, actually means whether the handle to the dump file uh, has been opened in user mode or the kernel mode, and buffer, uh, whether the buffer being written is from, uh, originates from the user mode or, or kernel mode. We'll talk about them later, but these are very interesting. Okay, so uh, now we have our hook installed and we know that memory dump is being created, but what now? Uh, all memory acquisition tools uh, work in a way that they read the page by, uh, memory page by page or in some page multiples and write those pages uh, back to the memory dump. Uh, one, uh, one possible solution is to uh, scan every buffer being written to the dump file and uh, search, it, uh, search it for some specific target objects for some interesting object that we want to hide. Well, that method is okay, we can do that, but it's both slow, inefficient, and can make your life harder. We'll see why later. So, uh, my solution that I have chosen is that when I detect that the uh, forensic dump uh, is being created, that uh, memory dump is being created, I create a sorted list of all physical addresses of my uh, target objects and all objects that are related to my target objects. So, uh, for example, uh, and uh, when a buffer is being written, if that buffer contains any of the physical, any, any physical addresses that I have collected, we simply hide them. We either delete them or change them. Uh, how do I know whether the buffer contains uh, one of those addresses? Well, that's a simple part because I know the, off the current offset inside the file. So I know the current file pointer position. And because the um, file layout is equal to the physical memory layout, I know exactly whether the buffer contains a uh, certain physical address or not. Okay, that sounds easy. But remember that we are dealing with undocumented kernel structures, that we are dealing with undocumented and unknown offsets, sizes, addresses, and everything else. Uh, here we can see that uh, e-process block uh, offsets differ from version to version of uh, Windows operating system. It's of course different on 64-bit uh, and 32-bit versions of Windows because of the pointer size differences. And we can simply, we could, um, I mean, I could have uh, hard-coded these offsets, but uh, I, I wouldn't want to do that. So if WinDebug can do it, we can do it also. Uh, my idea was to use uh, Microsoft PDB symbol files and use Debug Help API. Uh, this API is totally terrible. Don't use it if you don't need to. Avoid it at all costs, but okay, I did it and it works. <laughs> so um, the the mechanism works like this: uh, the kernel, I mean the driver, uh, builds out the list of symbols that it needs. For example, uh, process hider says, "Okay, I need offset of unique uh, process ID. I need offset of active process links. I need this offset. I need that offset. I need the address of this function, and so on." And it sends this list back to the user mode. User mode contacts Microsoft Symbol Server and downloads the necessary PDB files, parses it, and fills out the necessary details and sends it back to the kernel. Uh, you might ask whether this is dangerous because we are sending some unknown and untested data from user mode back to the kernel mode. And yes, that's true. It's a valid concern, but I have not found a solution yet for this problem. I could have uh, maybe uh, contacted the server di directly from the kernel mode and passed the PDBs uh, directly from the kernel mode, but that proved to be a bit too difficult, so I didn't do it. Okay, so now we have everything. We have our hook, we know that uh, memory dump is being created, and we know all the offsets and all necessary details, and we can start hiding some stuff. Okay, regarding the process hiding, we first uh, get our target process e-process block, and unlink the process from various process lists. Uh, for example, we unlink it from the active process list. Uh, by unlinking, I mean just rearranging the next and previous pointers. Uh, we also delete the process from the session uh, process links. We, uh, I, will uh, I will also delete it from the job list. It's not currently uh, implemented yet, but it will be. It's not, it's not hard to implement it. Uh, we also delete the entire process allocation, so we delete the entire e-process block. When I say delete, I don't mean we do anything on the live system. We are doing everything inside the buffer, inside the dump that is being written. So a live system is simply not touched at all. Uh, and then we hide related data. We go to, we, we hide the threads, we hide handles, virtual address descriptors, and all other stuff. 
So it might seem that process hiding is really simple, but in fact it's not, uh, because traces of process activities are lit literally everywhere. It's uh, really difficult to hide entire process uh, creation and open handles and uh, all those stuff, and uh, to, to remove it completely, I think it's very, very, very hard. Uh, we'll see how to delete some of the artifacts in the, in the next slide. Uh, also as a note to volatility developers, uh, it seems that just by deleting the process allocation, just by deleting the e-process block, uh, you are able to, uh, to fool almost every uh, volatility plugin that is related to uh, process listing. Of course, uh, you fool PS scan, but you fool even the PSX view. This is the plugin that was written for, uh, for detecting such uh, malicious modifications, so it, sh it's, uh, it should not be fooled by this so-called simple method. Uh, it seems that the main reason why, why is that so, why, why you can fool volatility, is that they use this dereference as call. Uh, it's trying to dereference unknown memory location as a known object, as for example e-process block. But if this block does not exist, if process allocation has been deleted, this dereference call fails and uh, volatility simply ignores it and goes to, to other data, goes to other processes. So maybe a better solution would be to ignore uh, checking the existence of e-process block and its validity and just uh, uh, leave the data and show it as is. For example, uh, if we have a handle and this handle is of type process, but it does not point to any valid e-process block or process allocation, never mind, just show the handle, just uh, make sure that the uh, incident handler sees it because uh, it could mean some uh, malicious, it could uh, indicate some malicious uh, modification. Uh, regarding threads hiding, uh, it's relatively easy. I mean, the methods Im implemented here are relatively easy. We delete the thread allocation, and we also remove the thread handle from the global list uh, of uh, global handle table of uh, thread and process handles called, called PSP CID table. Uh, be aware that there are some, there are still some uh, thread-related artifacts that are not hidden. For example, if thread has uh, any locks, or uh, if uh, thread is a member of any wait list, block list, or something like that, it's not deleted from this list, and it could be possible to detect it. But every memory analysis application that I have tested uh, completely fails to detect the deleted thread, uh, deleted thread when you just delete the thread allocation, and that's even more so when you remove the thread handle from the. PSP CID table. Uh, while the thread hiding was simple, uh, hiding handles and objects is definitely not. And I think uh, Dementia does a good job here. Uh, I first delete the process handle table. I completely remove the OBTB allocation. And I also unlink the table from the handle table list. Uh, I then traverse the process handle table and see whether there are any objects, any handles that are opened exclusively by my by target process. Uh, I do this by checking these uh, counts, uh, by these two counts in object header. So if point, pointer counter and handle counter are equal to one, this object is definitely opened exclusively by my process, so I can safely delete it. And I delete, bo I delete both the handle table entry and the object itself. Uh, if it's not opened exclusively by my, by my process, by target process, uh, I then uh, decrement these counts and uh, I hide the handle table entry because it's safe to do so. Handle table entries are not related to the object itself, but they are related to my target process. Okay, but that's not all because uh, target process handle is also uh, present in PSP CID table as a global handle table list. And it's also present in the handle table of CSRSS uh, process. So I also have to remove it from there. Uh, I then found this, uh, I, I then, then find this uh, target handle and remove it from these handle tables. Uh, as you can see, handle hiding can be really difficult. I'm sure that I have missed some, some parts of the, uh, some artifacts that are not hidden yet, but uh, could show um, some target process activities or, uh, or uh, traces. Uh, another note to volatility developers, 
uh, it seems that, uh, as you can see in the in the picture below, uh, it seems that they are uh, traversing the uh, when when listing active handles, they are uh, traversing the list of active processes. Uh, and then uh, dereference the handle table list using the object table member of the eProcess block. And uh, this, is, this is okay, but uh, an attacker could simply unlink the handle table of his malicious process from the ha handle table list. That's possible to do. Uh, your target process, your malicious process would not be able to open any objects or, or, or close them, at least using uh, Windows mechanisms. You could uh, write your own uh, uh, handle, handle engine or something like, like that. But uh, your process will still, will, would still run and the code, the code would still work. So uh, maybe a better solution for volatility is to write a plugin that does not traverse the handle table list, but scans for OBTB allocations instead, like they do for process allocation, thread allocations, and, uh, and some other objects. Uh, for memory allocations, it turned out that uh, it's rather easy. Uh, because all process memory allocations are described by virtual address descriptors. Uh, these are some uh, simple uh, kernel level structures that describe memory ranges that are uh, allocated by, our, by any process. Uh, these uh, VADs are uh, organized in a self-balancing binary tree called AVL tree, and the root of this tree is uh, stored inside the eProcess block, and it's called the uh, VAD root, VAD root. Uh, the hide algorithm is uh, rather simple. I traverse the entire tree. I delete the allocation itself. I, I mean the VAD descriptor, not the allocation itself, but the VAD descriptor. And uh, then I check if this VAD points to a private memory of the process. So if this, if, if, if this is a memory that is allocated uh, only by my process and it's used exclu exclusively by my process. If it is, I delete the entire all allocation. I hide the entire allocation. Uh, if uh, this VAD represents uh, my process memory image, so my EXE, uh, I delete that allocation also. Uh, if it describes some shared memory, for example, DLLs and uh, some other files, I first check whether this uh, shared memory is mapped only or used only by my target process. Uh, if it is, I delete it as well as uh, the object itself. So the file object, for example, DLL is also deleted. Uh, if it's not, I cannot do anything, so I just leave it be. I should have decremented the counters, but uh, no memory analysis application checks for these counters, and it's uh, really safe not to do so. But memory allocation hiding is relatively simple. Okay, so uh, another thing that Dementia does, apart from hiding processes, is driver hiding. Uh, this, uh, this support is rather weak and rudimentary, but it's effective nonetheless. Uh, I, delete the, I hide the drivers by uh, uh, unlinking the driver entry, the loader data table entry from the PS loaded module list. I delete the MMLD allocation itself, so the uh, loader data table entry itself. And I also delete the driver image in memory. Uh, as I said, this is very simple. It's not, uh, it's not definitely uh, a complete solution because uh, there are lots of other uh, elements of drivers that need to be hidden also. For example, driver pool allocations, kernel pool allocations are not hidden. And this is actually a difficult thing to do. I don't know how, how can I do it, but we'll think about it further. Uh, we can also, I'm, I'm also not deleting uh, symbolic links, I'm also not deleting driver objects, and uh, drivers hidden in this way can be detected uh, with volatility with, for example, uh, sim, sim links plugin and some other plugins. So the plugin that uh, scans for driver objects and some other plugins. Okay, so it's time for the demo. Let's hope it works. Do you see it? Okay. Okay, so, in just a second. Oh, there are lots of open windows. Okay, so I'm going to start uh, Dementia uh, in, kernel, in kernel mode, this mode that uh, places an inline hook on anti-write file. And I'm going to hide notepad.exe, and I'm going to hide uh, NTFS driver, which is uh, present in uh, Windows operating system. I couldn't think of a better driver to hide, so let's, let it be NTFS. Okay. So here it writes some data. Uh, 
it, it uh, successfully uh, filled out the symbol list and found, uh, found an output process. It's currently not doing anything. The hook is in place, but the uh, forensic application has not, uh, I mean, the memory acquisition tool has not yet been started. So it just waits for a memory acquisition tool. If we run a memory acquisition tool, I'll run, oh no, I won't run that. Oh, just a second. Where is it? Okay, yeah, here. Uh, I'll run Win32DD. I could run any uh, memory acquisition tool, but Win32DD is really fast, so I'll use this one. Uh, I'll use uh, standard values, so uh, th this method uses MMMap memory dump MDL method, so called PFN mapping, and we'll create a raw dump file called test.raw. Okay. We can see here that uh, the, the driver has detected some objects, some uh, uh, artifacts, and it's trying to hide them from the dump. Okay, so the process has finished. Let me unload the driver. So you see unhooking is working. And uh, I'm going to uh, list the processes using volatility, just a simple PS list. We should not see uh, notepad.exe here. Notepad.exe has process ID of, 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 of 3848. Okay, in the meantime, I'll also run Sessions plugin, which is a relatively new plugin for volatility. Uh, it scans, it shows the currently active Windows sessions. And uh, this plugin is cool because uh, many rootkits, although they do uh, unlink the process from active process list, they are not thinking about session link, uh, session list. And uh, although you cannot find the process in the active process list, you can find it in the session list. And this is a true uh, indication of a rootkit activity. So I'll run sessions also. If you move here, notepad should not be here. I hope it's not. Can you see it? No? I could have grabbed it, but okay. Okay, it's not here. At least I don't see it. Okay, I'll also run PSX view to show that it's hidden from this plugin also. Let's get back to let's get back to sessions. So also notepad.exe should not be visible here. It not it should not be visible in any session, not in this session or this session with ID one. Okay, I'm thinking it's not. Okay, cool. Uh, this count is also decremented, so if you uh, count out these processes, uh, this count should uh, should match. So uh, by comparing the count, by, by counting out the processes and comparing it to the count above, uh, it should raise no suspicion to the incident handler. Okay, let's get back to this plugin. Oh, this plugin is slow. Okay, let me run thread scan. Uh, let's find threads related to the process with ID 3848. 3848. This plugin is slow. Maybe this is this one is faster. Uh, uh, uh. Okay. So. When you see uh, these entries false, true, false, 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 uh, they are usually uh, indicating some terminated processes or some minor issues with the PSX view plugin. I'm not sure which one. Uh, but as you can see, Notepad is not here, is not in the list of these processes because the process allocation is hidden, so it shouldn't be present here. But it's also not in the list above. I hope it's not. If anyone can see it, shout. Okay, I think this works. Let me get back to, okay, this one works also because uh, no threads were found that are related to our target process, to our notepad.exe process, and the threads are, uh, are removed completely. Okay, uh, let's see about modules. Modules. Let me find the DFS. Okay, I have like 20 minutes left.
Okay, great. It seems to work. Let's get back to, to the presentation. Do you remember these columns? Uh, this was from the, from the table that uh, represented the patterns in uh, memory acquisition tools. Uh, as I said, uh, user mode handle means that the handle of the dump file has been opened in the user mode. Buffer user mode means that the buffer being written to the dump file is in user mode. Do you see anything suspicious here? Well, if memory dump is open in user mode, then it's vulnerable to uh, hooks placed completely in user mode. For example, write file hook or anti-write file hook. If the buffer is opened in user mode, and it's usually coupled with the file in user mode, with the handle in user mode, uh, then the buffer was passed back to the user mode from the driver, and it's, uh, it's vulnerable to device I.O. control or uh, anti-device I.O. control file hooks. Uh, if you look at the, at the list of the, of the forensic uh, tools, of memory acquisition tools, all of them except Win32DD are vulnerable to user mode attacks. So the tools are simply doing it wrong. They are mapping the, the physical memory and they are returning the pages back to user mode and the user mode itself is writing the dump file, which is a very bad thing. Uh, I have written a dimension model that can hide the processes, threads and connections. Uh, completely from the user mode. Uh, unfortunately, it does uh, require administrative privileges because the acquisition tool itself must run as admin, so this is a kind of disadvantage of this method. But to install the driver, you also need administrative privileges, so that's not a big disadvantage. Uh, it's relatively simple. It injects DLL to a forensic application process, to memory acquisition process, and uh, currently only Memorize is supported, but uh, adding a new, uh, injecting to a new process is uh, really a simple thing to do. Uh, it hooks a device I.O. control file using an import address table hooking, so it's uh, really not, nothing sophisticated or something, something big. Uh, it does sound simpler than the, than the kernel mode uh, hiding, but it's in fact much, much more difficult. Why? Because you have no knowledge of uh, virtual addresses inside the kernel. You cannot access kernel memory. You don't know what's inside the kernel memory, so you have no knowledge of kernel memory. Uh, additionally, you cannot easily perform virtual to physical translation because all you get is a physical, physical offsets and physical layout. And inside this physical layout, you get the virtual addresses that you don't know. So uh, it's difficult to perform virtual to physical translation like volatility because you have partial knowledge. You have only the current dump, which is a page or multiple pages long. Uh, one solution, I mean, the, the tool works like this. Uh, I search the, the current buffer being written to memory dump, uh, to, to a memory dump, and try to find some uh, target objects. If I found the target object, from, for example, a process, I delete entire allocation. Uh, if I find some object related to my target object, for example, if I find a thread or a connection, I also delete it. So this is an easy part. Okay, but what about process list unlinking? Well, yeah, that's the difficult part. Why? Because uh, when you have a process and you have pointer to the next process and pointer to the previous process, these pointers are virtual addresses and virtual addresses inside the kernel. Uh, I don't know anything about these addresses and I don't know anything about the, the objects, the previous and, uh, and the next uh, process. What I also don't know, and what's also possible, is that I encountered my uh, target process here, so it's somewhere here in physical memory, and my previous and next process, or next or pre previous processes, have already been written to the memory dump, so they are uh, at lower physical memory location. And that's, that's a big problem. My solution is, is the following. So, uh, Regarding the virtual addresses, uh, to determine a virtual address of an object, I use self-referencing fields, self-referencing members inside the e-process block. So for example, uh, there are lots and lots of lists inside the e-process block that are rarely, rarely used. Uh, and if, if the list is empty, it's pointing back to itself. So by sub subtracting the offset of the list from the value, you actually get the virtual address of your e-process block. I do it also for the threads and I don't need to do it for the connections. Uh, I then cache this object in, inside the dictionary where uh, my virtual address is a key to this dictionary and I also remember the offset, the physical offset where I encountered this object. Uh, and then uh, I do the following. Uh, I 
I fix the dump, uh, I, I fix the previous and next pointers by mo if, if an object was uh, in a lower physical memory address, I just move the, f uh, the file pointer of the dump file, uh, do modifications there, change uh, next and previous pointers, and restore the file pointer back to the current location. That's the, that, that's the solution to, to this problem. And it proved to be much more difficult than the kernel level, than, than the kernel level modifications and, and hiding. Okay, so we can see another demo. It's not very interesting, but okay. So I have, uh, I have started the NC. It's listening on the port 12345. And I'm going to hide it using the user mode component. Just a second to get hold of this. Uh -huh. Okay, so we are using the first method. We are, we are trying to hide NC. Uh, Dementia is currently waiting for Memorize to start. I'm going to start Memorize. Memorize is really slow, so it will take some time, but okay. So it, it has detected Memorize, and it has started to detect some uh, objects inside the dump. Uh, some of these objects are false positives, but uh, nevertheless, uh, true objects are also detected. For example, Explorer, CMD, Exe, and other objects. In the meantime, let me prepare Volatility. Just a second to see. Okay. It's not finished yet, but it will in a couple of seconds. Uh, it goes, yeah, it goes faster at the end because all of the data is, is at, the, at the end of the memory. Okay, cool. It's finished. Let's first list the process, processes. And let's do a net scan. Let's scan for network connections. Okay, so NC must not be listed here, and we should not see uh, TCP port uh, 12345 listening here. If that works, we are all good. <laughs> okay. We can just look at this. Uh, this column over there or over there, and try to see whether NC is listed here. Just a second. Okay, so it's not here. It's not here. And, and it's not here, below our UDP port, so UDP connections, so it's, uh, oh, great. Ah. Okay, so the connection is successfully hidden. Oh, it does sometimes happen. Ah. Demo can simply, cannot go good, right. Uh, okay, so sometimes, the PS list, if, if the process is the last process in list, somehow dementia does not uh, perform unlinking well. And uh, we can see that uh, although NC process is not listed, uh, PS list does list an orphan process, a process that is simply blank and has all fields set to zero. So that is definitely an indication for a, for an incident handler that something might be wrong, either with the memory analysis tool or uh, some malicious modifications have been have been made. Okay, nothing's perfect, but okay. Let's get back to the presentation. Okay. As you have seen, dementia has limitations. 
Uh, I'll focus on the kernel level uh, hiding. Uh, it's not currently hiding connections. It's not hiding uh, registry keys and values. Uh, it's not you. You are not able to hide uh, arbitrary files, arbitrary DLLs. Uh, thread hiding can be improved. Driver hiding must definitely be improved. Uh, one functionality that uh, Dimension currently lacks is uh, self-hiding. Uh, without it, it's uh, useless in your rootkit arsenal. So uh, it, 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 it is possible to specify uh, Dementia user mode process and kernel process, but uh, it's not a real self-hiding. Uh, I also have to port it to 64-bit completely uh, without crashes and, and uh, other things. That's definitely a work in progress. Okay, so uh, what we have learned is that uh, the acquisition tools uh, currently must utilize drivers correctly because uh, currently they are simply, most of them, are returning buffer back to the memory and doing the writes from the memory to, uh, f from the user mode uh, to the kernel mode, which is a bad thing as we have seen. Uh, so, uh, and it's also slow because the buffer is first returned to the user mode and then written to the dump file, which is slow and unnecessary. Uh, one good alternative is to use hardware acquisition tools, for example, uh, firewire memory acquisition. There have been lots of talks about firewire, and it's, it's cool, it works, it's, it's great, but sometimes it's uh, simply not possible because your target machine does not have a firewire port. It's uh, more, even more so with the servers. So if you don't have the port, you cannot use it, and this, is, this can pose some difficulties. Uh, another alternative is to use the native crash dump functionality which is built in into the Windows operating system. Why? Uh, because this crash dump uh, mechanism uses completely different, uh, completely different functions from the regular operating system. And it's really difficult to, to subvert them. It's difficult to, to uh, thwart uh, this kind of mechanism, but it, it is possible. I have done some research on that. Uh, another possibility is uh, for an acquisition tool to perform anti-rootkit scanning. I think it's unnecessary and stupid, but that could, th that's also a, a, a valid alternative. And another thing, you can simply live with it because uh, I hopefully I uh, hopefully I. Um, I demonstrated that any kind of live forensics is simply is inherently insecure and always if you don't have the control uh, over your system, someone can have control under, uh, over it and someone can subvert it. Okay, that's it. Thank you very much. So the, the, the project is hosted here, but uh, o only a simple SVN structure is here. The code will be uplo uploaded in the next few days when I chill out from everything. So, <laughs> Thank you for your talk. Uh, we have around eight minutes left for a quick Q&A. If you have questions, please queue up at the microphones over there, here, and then the gangway there. Uh, we also have questions from the IRC audience, which we will start with. Um, so someone asked is uh, whether XORing the contents before writing out to disk um, is a measure to subvert your detection. Sorry, sorry, I, I didn't hear it and I didn't oh, understand sorry. it. Um, the question is, is XORing the contents before writing out to disk enough to subvert your detection? Uh, to subvert my detection probably is because uh, NK Swinan is doing some hashing before writing the contents down to the uh, to the disk. Uh, it will subvert my uh, my tool, but uh, it's not uh, good protection. I think. I mean, if I can uh, if I can detect that the XOR is XOR is being used, or uh, if I know the tool, I can uh, simply implement that. Or um, I can. It, it depends whether it's uh, storing the the contents the dump from the user mode or, for, or from the kernel mode because if it's storing the dump from the user mode then I can uh, then I can hook a device IO control and when, when the buffer is still not XORed and uh, I can uh, I can modify it there so it depends I am very sorry I have to inform you that we have to cut Q&A short now so if you have any questions please do catch up with uh, with him after the talk okay